Hello everyone, once again welcome you all to MSP lecture series on advanced transmetallic chemistry. In my 12th lecture, I did uh, mention about interesting aspects of uh, valence bond theory and how there are some exceptions or how there are some you know different type of hybridization we came across to explain totally different type of bondings especially in case of heavier uh, p block elements where we have multiple bonding. Now we shall move on to another very fascinating concept which appears almost uh, uh, complete in explaining all properties, reactivity and all uh, applications and spectroscopic properties of transmetal complexes or coordination compounds that is crystal field theory. Before I really start digging into crystal field theory, let me try to give the background to this crystal field theory. The basic idea of the crystal field theory that the metal ions in the complexes uh, is subjected to an electric field originating from the ligands was first observed by Backquerel in 1829. The same Backquerel who discovered radioactivity along with uh, Marie Curie and Pierre Curie, uh, Henry Backquerel. The same year, Bitte, who has contributed significantly in developing crystal field theory, a physicist carried out work by correlating symmetry and crystal field strength influence on electronic levels of the gaseous metal ions and laid down an excellent foundation to crystal field theory. That means the Bethes contribution is quite remarkable in developing a complete concept of crystal field theory. Uh, during the same time, uh, Dutch physicist Kramers okay, reported that the electronic levels in molecules containing an odd number of electrons must remain at least twofold degenerate. So, this is also called as Kramer's degeneracy rule in the absence of any magnetic field which is closely related to Bates double group theory. In double group theory means when he started explaining, he told that the degeneracy of uh, gaseous metal ion will not remain intact when it enters to crystal field and it is destroyed and it forms a set of two groups. That is what he mentioned that is called Bethes double group theory and this is more or less uh, similar to what Kramers observed and called it as Kramers degeneracy rule. And that way many physicists contributed significantly for crystal field theory. In fact, the physicist who developed this theory which appears almost perfect even today to explain literally everything about transmetal complexes. The first application of new theory was made by Van Vleck in 1932 by realizing that the quenching of the orbital momentum would be a consequence of the crystalline field model. He succeeded in explaining why the paramagnetism of the complexes of the first transition series corresponds to a spin only value spin only value is calculated using the equation. Also the crystal field model was able to predict in which cases there would be small deviation from this empirical rule. That means crystal field theory explains involving orbital momentum the small variations that observed in the magnetic properties. Later calculations of Scalp and Penny and of Jordal all are physicists showed that both the anisotropy and the variation of the magnetic susceptibility with the temperature could be exactly predicted and calculated. So that means they showed that yes using crystal field theory one can use calculations and explain all these properties related to magnetic properties. They also confirmed that basic idea in the Bethe Van Vleck approach that the crystal field reduces the degeneracy of the electronic levels of the gaseous metal atom. That means yes they further confirmed that crystal field theory is correct and the degeneracy of d orbitals are destroyed or removed. Also another Dutch experimental and theoretical physicist Gorter showed in his paper with the crystal field of a regular tetrahedron will produce the same level as those produced by a regular octahedron but with the level order inverted. Now we know that 
how the splitting is in octahedral field is reversed in case of tetrahedral field. For example, in case of octahedral field, if you have E g higher energy and T 2 g lower energy, when you go to tetrahedral field opposite is true T 2 becomes higher in energy and E becomes lower in energy. So, this was predicted through experimental and theoretical work by physicist Gorter. So, later attention was given to understanding and calculating the magnetic behavior of the complex ions. Eventually, Van Wick's crystal field theory become a popular and a complete theory to explain almost all aspects of coordination compounds. So, later when ligand field theory and molecular orbital theory were developed, uh, there is a reason for modifying or refining crystal field theory to turn into ligand field theory and eventually come up with molecular orbital theory. There is a reason I shall tell you those things later. Crystal field theory and valence bond theory almost appear to be special cases of molecular orbital theory. So, that means it indicates molecular orbital theory has taken the best part of crystal field theory as well as valence bond theory and also one can call this modified molecular orbital theory is more or less same as ligand field theory. And these things were shown by Van Blick and also British physicist Penny and Penny again worked in looking into the magnetic properties of manganese ion and several other metal ions. The concept of a strong and weak ligand, work on potassium ferricyanide, manganese 2 ion and also magnetic behavior of vanadium, titanium and chromium proved the efficacy of crystal field theory. And unlike the coordination theory, too many conflicts came from Bloom's strand. So, here we did not see much of rivalry, but uh, people started looking into it and critically evaluating and start appreciating and also they used in their later work. With the input from crystal field theory, John and Teller, we call John Teller theorem or John Teller distortion, I am talking about the same two gentlemen here. With the input from crystal field theory, John and Teller had shown in 1937 that no nonlinear molecule could be stable in a degenerate state and such a configuration must immediately distort. That means, when we have this is more or less applicable for dx square minus y square and dz square because they are always lying in the direction of approach of the ligands especially in octahedral geometry and also this is pro more pronounced among octahedral complexes. That means, when they have uneven filling or uneven or odd number of electrons that is what it is referring. So, that means, no nonlinear molecule could be stable in a degenerate state and such a configuration must be immediately distort. So, via nuclear displacements in the molecule in such a way that the degeneracy is removed. So, that means such molecules will try to remove the degeneracy and go to lower symmetry. So, when we calculated the John Taylor distortions for molecules of the form ML6 that means octahedral molecules and showed how this configurational instability affected the magnetic moment of the molecules. Crystal field theory of Bethe and Van Blick does not consider the role played by the ligands other than producing a steady crystalline field. That means, the role of ligand ends there after generating an electric field to influence the metal ion and its electron. So, that is what crystal field theory is all about, but ligand field theory indicates a hybridization of the pure crystal field theory with molecular orbital theory of Mullikan. So, what ligand field theory does is it uh, takes hybridization concept and also it takes pure crystal field theory and also considers molecular orbital theory of Mullikan. So, that is the reason it is a very perfect and refined theory to explain literally everything related to ligand field theory. There are few things that could not be explained with the crystal field theory that also can be explained without any ambiguity using ligand field theory. So, the ligand field theory incorporates the best features of both the pure crystal field theory and the molecular orbital theory and is a superior route for understanding the metal complexes considering all aspects. So, nearly all the results of the crystal field theory are also valid in the ligand field theory. And now as precisely these people concluded, crystal field theory are uh, looks like 
a subsidiary branch of ligand field theory. Although crystal field theory contributed significantly to come up with ligand field theory. So, these are the some references that are pertinent to early work on crystal field theory before Bain and Wathwick proposed their wonderful crystal field theory. If you are interested, you can look into these books and also papers. So, now we know that crystal field theory is an electrostatic model and uses the ligand electrons to create an electric field around the metal center. So, that means the electric field that is generated with the ligands that are approaching the metal, they have a greater influence on deciding what kind of geometry a metal should assume. And so, attraction between the central metal atom and the ligands in a complex is purely electrostatic. That means, according to crystal field theory concept, the attraction between the central metal atom and the ligand in a complex is purely electrostatic. That means, if the metal is a cationic in nature and the ligands are anionic, then it is purely the ion ion interaction. Okay. On the other hand, if the metal is cationic and the ligand is neutral and ligand will generate a dipole. So, then it is called ion dipolar interaction. How it generate dipole? When you have a ligand such as ammonia or water because of the electronegativity difference N or oxygen would carry negative charge and whereas, peripheral hydrogen atoms carry positive charge. Now, this negatively charged N or O will be directed towards the metal that is the reason we call it as ion dipolar interaction. Metal is a positive ion of charge equal to its oxidation state and is surrounded by negative or neutral ligands such as ammonia or cyanide. The negative end of the dipole in the ligand is directed towards the metal ion. The electrons on the metal center are under repulsive forces from those on the ligands. That means, when the ligands are approaching the metal with a pair of electrons and already electrons are present in d orbitals, they would experience a repulsive force. As a result of this one, the electrons already present on the metal would occupy d orbital furthest away from the direction of approach of ligands. That means, when the ligands are approaching the metal and the electrons already present in the d orbitals will occupy positions farthest away from the direction of approach of the ligand. And here ligands are just point charges and crystal field theory gives emphasis and it states that no metal and ligand orbital interaction. That means, according to crystal field theory, there is no orbital interaction in metal complexes. In the free metal, all the d orbitals have the same energy and are degenerate. You take a metal ion, metal atom, you atomize into metal, gaseous metal ion till all the d orbitals are degenerate. Once they enter into ligand field, the ligand field destroys the degeneracy of those orbitals and they possess different energies depending upon the type of ligand field we have in the vicinity of metal center. So, that is depicted in this diagram. Electrostatic interaction between metal ion and donor atom is what crystal field theory says. For example, if you just look into it, separated metal and ligands have high energy and coordinated metal and ligand stabilize it to here and then destabilization due to ligand d electron repulsion. Always when the metal to ligand bonds are established, the energy would tend to decrease, but on the other hand, the electrons that are already present in the metal atom would experience repulsive forces as a result again energy is elevated and further splitting due to octahedral field is shown here. So, that means you one should be able to write in this order separated metal and ligands and uh, this is electrostatic attraction and metal ion plus coordinated ligands will be lower in energy and ligand d electron repulsion would increase it and then depending upon the direction of approach of the ligands and the orbits in which electrons are there, the splitting takes place in this fashion. And this is a typical splitting pattern I have shown for an octahedral complex where T2G is triply degenerate and EG is doubly degenerate, EG is nothing but dz square and dx minus y square and T2G is nothing but dxz, dyz and dxy orbitals. To make it clear, I have shown here. So, free metal and plus ligands would be having higher energy 
and then metal ligand electrostatic interaction establishes metal to ligand bond and as a result energy drops considerably and then the repulsive forces increases and depending upon the type of ligands we have and their relative orientation with respect to the direction of approach of the ligand they split and this splitting with vary with various ligand fields. The splitting would be different for different crystal fields for example, octahedral, square planar, tetrahedral, trigonal, bipyramidal all those things. Now one by one we shall start looking into those things. So what is ligand field theory? Ligand field theory is one of the very useful bonding theories to explain the electronic structure of complexes. It is originated from the crystal field theory of ionic crystals to metal complex system. When this theory was originally developed to understand solid state chemistry. So consider a ligand field generated by 6 ligands coordinating octahedral to a central metal atom. Of course, it is very appropriate to call crystal field theory as ligand field theory because the electric field is greatly influenced by the ligand field. So, the ligands that are approaching the metal ion as a result probably it is more appropriate to call this theory as ligand field theory rather than crystal field theory. So, consider a ligand field generated by 6 ligands coordinating octahedrally to a central metal. The electron pairs of the ligand is called the ligand field to electrons R pair of electrons negative charge of ionic ligands or negative end of a neutral ligand exert repulsive force on the d orbitals on the metal d orbitals which is anisotropic depending on the direction of the orbitals. These are the fundamental aspects one should remember. Now consider the metal cation at the origin from which Cartesian coordinates are considered. It is very simple you write Cartesian coordinates x axis, y axis and z axis and you extend it so that x axis minus x, y minus y, z minus z is there. At the origin place the metal atom and then also at the origin try to keep all 5 d orbitals and you just analyze their relative orientation. So your job is done. So now when you look into their relative orientation and the direction of approach of the ligands for example after putting the metal atom at the Cartesian coordinate origin now bring 6 ligands in octahedral fashion. That means now if you try to write an octahedral geometry with metal at the origin of Cartesian coordinate you can see uh, the direction of approach of uh, ligands towards the metal coincide with z minus z, x minus x, y minus y directions. So now if you look into dx square minus y square and dz square are oriented along the direction of the axis that means dx minus y square is oriented along x and uh, minus x and y and minus y. dz square is along z axis. So that means whatever the ligands that are approaching along these would experience maximum repulsion as a result energy is elevated. On the other hand when the 6 ligands are approaching along the 6 directions and if you look into the orientation of uh, other remaining d orbitals such as dxy, dyz and dzx they are between these axes, they are between these planes as a result what happens they experience less repulsive forces from the electrons coming from the ligands as a result what happens their energy is lowered with respect to the zero energy or barycenter. If ligands are placed on the axis the repulsive interaction is larger for EG orbital that is what I mentioned then for the T2G orbitals and the EG orbitals are destabilized and the T2G orbitals are stabilized to an equal extent. Okay. The energy difference between the T2G and EG orbital is important and the average energy of this orbital is taken as zero energy that is where we put Barry center. If the energy difference between the 2 eg and the 3 t2g orbital is set to delta o this is called crystal field stabilization energy for octahedral splitting. The energy level of the eg orbitals is plus 3 by 5 delta o and that of the t2g orbital is minus 2 by 5 delta o. So if you put here 4 electrons and if you put here 6 electrons then you will end up with 0 electron okay, at this barycenter. So delta o may also be expressed as 10 delta q or 10 dq. In this case the energy level of the EG orbital is plus 6 dq and that of the T2G orbital is minus 4 dq. So this is how crystal field stabilization energy is defined.
I think uh, I will stop here and I will give some time for you to read and understand. In my next lecture, I will proceed with uh, explaining more geometries uh, through simple methods so that you should be able to write Christopher splitting diagram literally for any geometry that comes to your mind. With this, have an excellent time reading chemistry.